Hello, and welcome to The Staffing Show, the only podcast that delivers tools, tips, and tactics from the staffing and recruiting industry's top executives and thought leaders. Today's podcast is brought to you by Staffing Referrals. At Staffing Referrals, we understand the challenges your agency faces every day. From finding high-quality candidates and clients to automating your recruitment process, our platform is designed to help you grow your agency faster. Imagine a world where your agency can automatically build your talent community, improve your recruiter's productivity, and automate manual processes, all the while improving the candidate experience. But don't just take our word for it. Here's what a few satisfied customers have to say. Our referral program boomed after partnering with Staffing Referrals. The technology allows us the tracking, communication, and reporting our traditional referral program desperately needed to unify and expand. Can't imagine our business without it. Are you ready to transform your staffing agency? Let's reduce your dependency on job boards, deliver the experience your candidates expect from a modern business, and turn your talent pool into a competitive advantage. Visit staffingreferrals.com and get ready to grow. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of The Staffing Show. Today, I am super excited to be joined by Justin Clark, who is the founder and CEO of FStaff On Demand Truck Drivers. For those of you that don't know, FStaff is the only two-sided marketplace for CDL drivers in the world. Justin, I've known you for about a year at this point, and I am so excited to have this conversation with you today. We're going to be diving into technology, trends in staffing. To kick things off, could you just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into staffing? Sure, yeah. So FStaff On Demand Truck Drivers is a convergence of a company that was originally founded in 2001 called Contracted Driver Services and eventually formed into now what is known today as FStaff On Demand Truck Drivers. And really, I, I got into this business When I was 19 years old, my mom was working for another staffing agency. That's where I learned about the business model to begin with. I was inspired by a couple of professors who saw, you know, my business planning and my understanding about maybe what I could do and really just inspired me to go down that road of creation and starting a business on my own. That's really how I I got started. That's awesome. Did, were you a recruiter in your mom's business or did in, in, was it in the trucking business to start? Is that where you had the expertise at that age? Yeah, my mom was actually working for a, what well, ended up becoming a competitor of ours. So my mom was for maybe about a dozen years working for a driver staffing agency. And so I, I really understood the model really well just by seeing her work for this other company. Yeah. I never actually worked for this other company. Okay. I never had a job as a recruiter. All of my first jobs inside of the staffing industry were were inside of the creation of the business. So unlike a lot of people who start as a recruiter, learn a lot more about the job (laughs) and the the industry, I literally just thrusted myself directly into it, right? It was like, I'm going all in. (laughs) My learning curve was, my learning curve was huge, right? (laughs) That's, that's great. I didn't, I didn't realize that. And so with that, what are some of the challenges that you've had over the years with growing your business? Man, okay, so 22 years, there's been always a bump in almost every single year, right? There's learning moments and there's things that that we do. I would say my earliest failure, you know, initially, like what did I learn is to really research and understand a lot more about what you're doing before you do it. Uh, When I started this business, I actually started a contracting business, putting CDL drivers on assignment and not in a staffing environment. And then I ended up payrolling some at another account where I became a staffing company and learned quickly that I was making a lot of mistakes in uh, mistaxation and and, uh, (laughs) uh, uh, insurance and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, huge learning curve there. And I would say most recently, we're just really learning a lot more about people management, right? And KPI controls and understanding how to leverage process, you know, inclusion inside of the company to really just form a more consistent business model over time. So yeah, it was fun. Yeah. And and I know one of the things I'm really excited to talk with you about today and and something that I think our audience is, if you're not looking into it, I feel like the two-sided marketplace is the staffing as a platform, however, whatever term you want to use for it, it's had a big impact in the last few years. And it's something that I know you jumped right into. Could you tell us a little bit how you kind of started down the path of getting excited about or involved in the text space? I think you had a story related to something with yeah. a, with specific to paper, yeah. like the most yeah. literal. Absolutely. (laughs) Right. So 
Our business is as a CDL truck driver staffing agency. So every CDL driver that we hire has to have a full driver qualification file, which means that each file has at minimum 25 to 30 pieces of paper in it, which is their full history, their background, their motor vehicle report, everything you can imagine about you know needing to qualify a truck driver because you need to qualify, make sure that, that the information is accurate and you're putting quality professional people out on assignment. So we can't, like some staffing agencies, just take a one-page paper application in. So we had stacks of paper and we're hiring hundreds of drivers. You know, I had paper flying everywhere, right? There was paper, paper, paper all over my offices, including timesheets that would come in every single week. And every applicant that we would uh, bring in, we had to keep the applications and all of the information around for several years, right? So managing the paper was exceptionally hard. And that was something that really drove me towards technology. But when, one of my offices, we actually had these racks at, a, at one time full of banker boxes of all of our driver qualification files. So I was in that office organizing those files and I was putting like <laughs> one last box on the wall pretty much, right? Where there's like 50 boxes probably on a wall on these different shelves. As you can imagine, each box probably weighs 40, 45 pounds. And so I'm not an engineer. I am a staffing professional right, owner. And so I'm in the back and I'm putting these boxes up and I didn't realize that these shelves went past their weight bearing. And I had a, a complete wall of driver files crash down on me and make me fall <laughs> off of a ladder, you know, onto the floor, right? And I'm probably yelling and screaming in the background, right? And people come flying over the office. And that was a pain point of mine because I'm like, this is ridiculous. You know, I can't be, you know, managing my business off of paper for yeah. any time in the future. So after that moment, I started looking for a software that would replace this experience, which was very hard to find. I ended up finding an ATS uh, at the time. It was like 2006, 2007. We found an applicant tracking system. We were one of the first staffing agencies to fall in love with applicant tracking systems. And it, it allowed us to start to at least mitigate and reform our, our staffing agency uh, around a paperless model. So we wouldn't have these boxes flying off the walls and trying to kill the owner, right? Just trying to manage the paper. So yeah, paper pain was huge for me. And that's what really drove us towards technology. I, I just think that's the best like entry <laughs> point into the digital transformation ever is like almost dying by like, yeah. being like clobbered by paper and then being like, okay, like this is dumb. Let's move forward here. Oh God. Yeah. I could, yeah, I could, I could stack bonfires with all of the paper that we had around the office, right? <laughs> Oh, uh, God, it's tough days. And it's great. Bro. Now that we have technology, it really allows us to be more seamless and to have a more controlled model because paper is really a, an error filled model. And so when you can have a data centric business model, it does definitely reduce human error points and creates a lot of efficiency. So I'm all, yeah. all in on technology, especially in the staffing industry. I've started off getting clobbered by paper and now leading the, the charge on the tech front. So uh, <laughs> Right, yeah. we are. Oh. So I know you and I talked briefly previously about how you think staffing is kind of broken. Could you share your perspective on that? Sure. Yeah. So when we started our staffing agency, I think, again, I modeled it you know, very closely to how other staffing agencies have built their businesses, which is you know, really a branch model. Most staffing agencies will grow organically by adding branches into cities that they currently don't service. And then that branch becomes the place where you put a manager and a recruiter and usually a salesperson to run the business in that city. You know, that model's been around for decades now. It was probably around 2010, I started to see some major flaws with that business design because the branches often are inconsistent in the services that they provide, right? Like the Denver staffing office for one staffing agency might act completely different than the Dallas branch. And I didn't like that, right? I like to have a nice consistent approach. And no matter what we did with, with our processes and culture and things like that, we still found that there were some change, I would say material breaches almost to how we wanted to operate our business in that area. And so I started to see a lot of inefficiencies with the branch offices and, and that's you know one area. So I, I do, I, I talk and I say the, that staffing is broken because I don't believe that staffing agencies need branch offices in every city to succeed if you leverage technology appropriately, right? I think that you can remove that layer and really remove that cost 
from the price that you have to charge to your customer. Because if you have to have branches, then that means that there's a whole level of cost that you have to incorporate into the pricing model that you provide to the customer. So the more efficient you can make your staffing agency, the better you can at controlling your margin by either offering discounts or pricing discounts to your customers or by improving the margin to your staffing agency. So branch offices, I think, are dead. I think it's kind of like the old school fax machine or something like that. That's how I equate it to. It's just, <laughs> just like, it's like, so yeah, some people still have them around, you know, and, and yeah, they still work. But I think that in the end, people are going to find that branch offices are not really going to be a model that is going to be a required future for most staffing agencies. I know the uh, a common rebuttal to that is what about the people that want to come in face to face, the the interviewing, that direct interview process. How do you? Yeah. How do well, so yeah. here's what I'll say about that. Things change. The same thing. Do you remember my conversation about paper applications, right? So yeah. I had pain about paper, but my team, even my internal staff, my internal team told me truck drivers will never complete a digital application, Justin. Yeah. Truck drivers are old school, Justin. Truck drivers won't do that, Justin. And I continued to just fight that and fight my vision forward. And now very few trucking companies that take a paper application these days. If you do, I mean, you are really a non-efficient trucking company. You're probably small and and likely not going to be able to grow for sure. You know, things change, David. So I think that people will interview in a, in a different way in the future. I think that might include different technologies and new technologies and uh, potentially even artificial intelligence type of tools that will help continue to make the process better. Because honestly, do you like driving to places just to go and to see somebody face to face, you know, to find out that you actually don't want to work with them anyway? Yeah, right? Like, absolutely. Of course not. Of course not. Right. And so I think that ultimately the solution that provides the most efficient outcome for people will win. And I think that the future of interviewing and the future of hiring and the future of placing in people is going to change. You know, there's definitely a, a morphing of that future right now. I second that. And I also think it is funny when you think about all of the the times where people are like, oh, that our population, whatever segment you're in, uh, and you're saying like, th- this isn't how our candidates work. And it's like, maybe not today, and maybe not right. all of them today, but right. eventually, <laughs> like, right. out, things are going to change one way or the other. Like we didn't used to buy stuff online. <laughs> now, now look at Amazon. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so. Everybody orders everything online now, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like you've done it. When you look at the model being broken, the branches, the cost of it, just in terms of also the kind of alignment as component to when it comes to kind of digitizing your environment, I think a lot of staffing agencies have trouble with that and probably are like, how do how do they shift from a branch model? Any advice on lessons learned that you've had in terms of shifting towards more of a centralized model and going with the platform play? Yeah, I think it's important first to look at your process and you just look at technology to help you optimize your process. And people oftentimes just focus on the outcome or things that they're looking for. And I and I really like what we've learned over the years of building technology and, you know, really creating this future for ourselves because it wasn't even available in, in many ways beforehand, right? Like, I just think the future of staffing is is going to be a lot more about reducing friction for the people that are actually hiring the workers and for the workers themselves. Right now, the staffing agencies continue to provide you know, too much friction in front of their customers. And I feel like that's, that's definitely going to drive you know, a lot of the future. And the platform model, it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. So you do have to start with your current process and just see where you could influence your business with technology. And if ultimately a talent marketplace is good for you, then that might be you know the solution that that works for you and your business model and your clients. It may not work for everybody, I meant for every staffing vertical. But in the end, I think that technology will be a driver of every staffing agency in the next decade, whether they find it now or in ten years from now. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think the friction is something that. I spent a good amount of time in conversion rate optimization on websites, and people don't understand how small things can really interrupt the process or just reduce applications as a whole. I mean, one stat that I don't know how accurate this is today, but it was a few years back that for every additional form field you added to a form on your website, it was like a 20% reduction in conversion rates. And so Mm -hmm. people don't realize, people are just like, 
assume that everybody's going to go through every step of every process without actually thinking about what it's like from the candidate side. So I think that right. the looking at where you can reduce friction is so important from a candidate perspective and an agency side. Do you have a process when you look at friction, like things that you can reduce friction for the talent you're working with? Or do you have a kind of any suggestions for the audience and ways that they could approach improving their their processes? Definitely. As you look at your process, you know, you can get a quick stopwatch out and you can time. I mean, <laughs> that's great. Really, I, love that. I mean, I love as, that. as simple as that is, but you can that's time the it. amount of time that it takes you or your human beings to do the steps, right? Oh, that's and then great. I would really look at that to identify the speed, you know what I mean? As as a driver making those decisions, you know, but I just, yeah, just old school, man, look at your process and clock the time and see, you know, how much it takes and then really track your speed and efficiency and make sure that that's driving the direction you want it to go. I've never even thought about that. Just the time alone and being that, having that be the, the metric. That's a great way to do it. It reminds me, I just watched the bear and uh, I don't <laughs> know if you that show, but in that show, like, is like laying out the kitchen and he's like seeing how quickly he can get through all the stations and timing it to try to get like, I need to be able to get through all the stations here, like four seconds. Uh Yeah. I think, I think the best business minds think that way, right? Because it all (laughs) is about that in the end, especially if you have human beings doing certain jobs, or even if you're going to replace it and optimize it with technology, it should always be about the speed. You know what I mean? And the friction around, you know, that like if an employee, if it takes him 10 days to complete the, your, your hiring process, and it's <laughs> yeah. but it's beautiful, right? Yeah, hey, yeah. Who cares, right? The candidate's yeah. going to hate it, you know? Yeah. So uh, speed is definitely on everybody's mind, whether they, whether they probably mention it or not. Absolutely. So one of the things that I know is changing in the market is kind of the perception of value created by staffing agencies. And I think that's happening across the board. I mean, I think there's all these online talent platforms. Like I frequently will go to Upwork if I need a project done and just hire somebody quickly. I don't have to go out to my network for something. And I know you're talking about kind of building that as a platform for F staff. What are some of the changes that you are hearing from your customers or clients in terms of where they're seeing value and in terms of where the market's going? Mm -hmm. So I think for us to actually achieve an on-demand future, we we really have to be all about the information that we can collect and share to both sides of the fence and then actually reduce or eliminate that, you know, as much as possible. So, you know, again, looking at speed factors, right? I think, and we've actually been able to prove this, it's faster for a one of our clients to put in an order directly through our portal and have that order directly go to the candidates who are the best suited workers for that job than for the carrier or the you know the employer to call my team first and then we call the candidates and then we match and then we call back right so in our model our employer partners get to put the job directly into the portal that algorithm is masterly kind of protected and making sure we find the right candidates at the right time for the right job. And then the uh, employer gets their needs met a lot faster and the workers go to work a lot faster. And in the end, if I say that I actually care about the people that I work with, that's what I need to be all about. You know, so we've learned that on demand, it's just not, it's not only a cleaner approach and you get more structured data around everything. It's better for the customer in the end, right? Because our workers have agreed that getting the jobs on demand right on their fingertips, they know that we aren't filtering the jobs for them. So they get to pick and choose and take the jobs that best match to them. Employer partners, you know, get to get access to the workers immediately and they're not delayed by a phone call from a recruiter or a missed call from a recruiter or having to leave a voice message, waiting for things, right? I don't believe that people should, well, first of all, I don't be, I don't believe people want to wait for anything anymore. And when no. we have to wait, when we have to wait, it's annoying. And then we're going to go figure out how to solve our problems in another way. And so yes. staffing companies before, I mean, when we had a lot more time on our hands, I think we're adding value because, you know, we were at the desk ready anytime you needed. Now, that's not the case. It's actually difficult to reach people on the phone these days, right? We have different meetings and different times that, that we're getting sucked away. And so I just believe in direct access. Our customers should be able to order and get direct access to the candidates. Our candidates that we approve for work should get direct access to the job, get direct access to the jobs, and everybody can continue to work as fast as they need to. Yeah, I feel like we live so much in the world of now. It's like I need it now. I need it ASAP. And it used to be next day delivery was a big deal. Then it was two hour delivery from Amazon. And now I'm just like door dashing stuff from Target. (laughs) 
<laughs> like, yeah. I like, can't wait. There was, I need there was, it now. There was a board game the other night. I was like, I want this, but we had a people coming over. I'm like, oh, I can get it from Target in 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, <"What?" laughs> while I see, while I keep the dinner party <laughs> rolling, while while you know? Ripley delivers the booze. <laughs> I mean, isn't that convenient, right? Like, I'm all about that future. Like, yeah. I'm an early adopter to Netflix, right? Like, I talk about this sometimes. Sometimes people are earlier adopters. Sometimes people are later adopters. I was the one getting the DVDs mailed to my mailbox, Same. right? Because I was like, right. I was like, yeah. oh, this is awesome. I don't have yeah. to go to Blockbuster now. Yeah. And it was not, it really wasn't yeah. that much better. Like now, and then once Netflix took the digital leap forward, right, you were able yeah. to see like how their vision of providing content to you as quickly as they could and as quickly as you wanted it eventually morphed into the digital behemoth that Netflix is today, right? And so, yeah, the digitization is happening everywhere. And I think in human capital management, it just hasn't really caught anywhere yet, anywhere big where there's actually somebody that's that has masterfully understood how to consider both sides of the fence and then get out of the way. Well, it's also funny. I mean, you talk about the, I feel like the Netflix is such a great example. You were talking about earlier about how who's going to adopt and when a little bit and like people saying, oh, our customers don't do that. And I definitely hear, I hear agencies say our customers don't want to put their orders in and maybe not today, but someday there's a high likelihood that they will. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Netflix story, I don't know if you know the Blockbuster Netflix, how Blockbuster actually had a chance to buy Netflix two and they all two times. Yeah, two times. Yeah, yeah. I just ride the one. They said really. no twice, right? Yeah. <laughs> I heard the story. They like flew out there, met with all of the executives at Blockbuster. Blockbuster like laughed them out of the room. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's right. like because they're like, oh, nobody wants to do it this way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Things that's change. a little. It's it's a little bit how we feel today at F staff. To be honest with you, David. Right. Yeah. Like, I feel like I'm I'm this guy that's been fighting, you know, from this corner that nobody's understood for a while. I've been, I mean, we started writing our own technology under a company called Forward Staffing in like 2009, 2010. Oh, that's amazing. And so that's why we understand so much more about what today looks like and what the future looks like is because we've been envisioning this place already for over a decade. I and mean, we've been building towards this place for over a decade. And now I think it's just becoming popular at industry conferences. Because when I was talking about it at industry conferences, even four years ago, I was kind of feeling like a wacko, right? Like, <laughs> people were like yeah, this guy's nuts, right? And yeah. I still am a huge believer though in it, right? And I and I yeah. still don't even think that we have fully achieved the vision that we're after, right? And so that's why we that's why we continue to fight every day, you know, to keep pushing and forward. While we're talking about the future of staffing and tech, like the platform play is obviously huge. And I know everybody's talking about generative AI. Any thoughts there? Are you using it? In it's your first coming. Life? It's yeah. coming so fast. We are in the middle of developing a partnership with an AI tool that will help us with some of the onboarding pieces with the business. We're really excited about the potential and where that can grow. And then I'm absolutely, a, I'm a nerdy researcher of staffing technologies, right? And so I'm constantly looking for, you know, stuff to look into, demos to have, so I could really understand a little bit more about what's coming. But first of all, it is coming. I've tested recruiters that were uh, AI recruiters that were developed in a weekend that had value. OK, they weren't perfect and they weren't ideal yeah. in a in a business case like today, but they were good and they were valuable and they were created in a weekend. OK, <laughs> so I will just say that because of the advanced AI language models that are now coming out, they are forming the ability for businesses to be created so we can go solve these problems faster. So yeah, they're coming. And I think that staffing agencies should all look towards them. I think that whether it replaces inner recruiting or whether it replaces offshore recruiting or augments it. And I think a lot of times I think yeah. when I think of AI, I think of augmentation, not replacement in a lot of ways, right? And so how does it augment your future and where what areas can you use AI to influence your business? But if I'm a smart CEO in staffing, I'm absolutely looking into this stuff. Absolutely. And I've been to three or four conferences where I've heard the same thing. First time I heard it, I was like, oh my God, that's, this, that's such a great thought. It's still a great thought. I've just, it's become cliche in almost a month is that people are like, oh, are recruiters, AI, is AI going to replace recruiters or is AI going to take my job? And what I've heard multiple times is AI may not, probably won't take your job, but somebody who uses it will. <laughs> mm, <laughs> right. And I think that might just go for agencies too. It's like, is, is AI going to replace an agency? It's like, no, but agencies that use AI will dominate the mm. industry. So you bet. 
amazing how much can accelerate things. So mm-hmm. I, I'm using it daily. It's like my little assistant that I have up all day long. <laughs> is, I mean, yeah, I think that you can get so much more accomplished, you know, with these new tools. People don't realize how amazing it is. And when things continue to evolve over the next decade, I mean, I, again, I don't even, I can't even really fully fathom what the world looks like, you know, but I think that there's a lot of disruption and a lot of human disruption and, and a lot of kind of unique AI design that's coming that's yes. going to make our worlds just really, really better, right? In a lot of ways. And I think so too. I think there's a, a lot of upside to it. So you've talked a lot about what you guys are doing today and some of your vision for the future, but what does the future look like for F staff? So at first, you know, we are understanding how to build an on-demand future, right? For the CDL driver staffing market, right? And I think that, you know, we haven't yet expanded our vision out beyond, you know, supply chain staffing, but eventually, I mean, we may, we may be first to market to be able to actually produce a fully functioning two-sided marketplace that's live on demand, human labor, capital acquisition, right? So when I think like that, if we're only thinking about this, this one division for the future of F-Staff, I really do believe that might be a little short-sighted. So I think that the future of F-Staff is, is big. And I think that, you know, we are really trying to see what we can do to, to bring a solution to the industry that's honestly begging for it. But, you know, I think that staffing agencies that are moving kind of just in micro bits, they're not changing the game and they're not making it, they're not creating a different ecosystem. So I think that in the next 12 months, we will have developed pretty far into the future of staffing. And we'll start to look at what does a full vision look like for F staff. But, you know, really it's, I would say that for your audience, it's removing the Berlin wall of staffing. And what I mean by that is just allowing, again, for our customers and our candidates to meet, greet, and hire at the speed that they desire. And then we will continue to be the best catalyst for support by getting out of the way, right? So if we can remove ourselves from the equation in as many ways as possible and allow direct access for employers and workers to, to work together together. I think we have changed the game to allow for, you know, kind of just a much better future for workforce management all the way around. I love it. I I feel like you are uh, pushing things forward and doing some really great things on the tech side. So I've got just a a handful of last kind of speed questions for you here. So what advice do you wish you were given before entering the staffing industry at the young Uh, age of 18? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So I would say if I was going to give advice to my future self, it would be to find balance early. Over the years, last two decades, I've been able to find a good balance of balancing my desire for growth and the passions I have for business with my life. But early on, when I was first creating this company, I was so all in that I would say that I definitely did sacrifice friendships, relationships, and time in a certain part of my life where if I would have really been focused on finding balance, then I think that that would have been a better reflection now of that time. Because I look back now and I just remember grinding out 16 hour days, saying no to <laughs> a lot of fun and just going for in this business. And I think that's, that's in one way, that's probably what's propelled us and gotten us as far as we have, but it is a big sacrifice for those that are, you know, considering it, at least uh, if I was at least given the, the feedback to say, Hey, find balance or search for balance early on. I think I would have at least fought for it early. That's great. And uh, in the last five years, what new belief behavior or habit has most improved your life? Oh, okay. Habitually, I try to perform one act of kindness a week at least, and it's incorporated probably really kind of something in my life that I do daily. When you can incorporate kindness as something that you are doing you know, regularly, like performing random acts of kindness or being thoughtful about uh, being kind, I think that it really sets your mindset in the direction of kindness. And I think you're nicer to other people. Other people are nicer to you. And so it just creates a better world all the way around. So I would say the habit of kindness Love it. Love it. Double down on that advice. Last question I've got for you is what book or books have you given most as a gift or has been most influential to you? For just people who are trying to understand a little bit more about, you know, a lot of life and business. I, I love Simon Sinek's book, Start With Start With Why, because it's just I think it's the right place to start for a lot of leaders when you're just making decisions and trying to push yourself forward. So I do love that book. 
my wife and I, we actually authored a couple of the children's books. I don't know if I've given you a couple of copies of them or not. We have a foundation for kindness that we have actually created. And we That's have a couple, amazing. Children, yeah, a couple of children's books. And so I give those out regularly at airports when I'm traveling. We uh, do our best to try to give those out. So that's uh, probably the, the number one book that I've given out as yeah. much as possible. Uh, I love that. That's amazing. That's great. Mm-hmm. Any closing comments for our audience? I would say that at our office, you know, we say truckers drive everything. And your staffing audience, I'm sure, is filled with you know staffing professionals and, and agencies that serve uh, their population, right? And I would just inspire your audience to keep that in mind. It might be nurses drive everything, or it could be accountants drive everything, or but whatever that is for you and your staffing agency. And for us, it's truckers drive everything. So I would say that let's live our lives leading these companies, thinking about our workers and not ourselves as much as possible. So that's what I would leave everybody with. I love that. Well, Justin, this is a a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for being on the show. It was a blast. Thanks, David. Thanks for listening to The Staffing Show. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at staffinghub.com to never miss an episode. Until next time.